Hello, everyone, and welcome to Navara Live. I am Dahlia Gabriel, and I am thrilled to be joined today by Helena, aka No Justice, on YouTube and Twitch. How are you doing, Helena? I'm doing very well. It's been a while since we've shared uh, hosting duties together, and absolutely looking forward to the show. It's a pleasure, as always. Me too. It's been too long, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, Today, coming up later in the show, um, we are going to talk about the blowback from Starmer's purge of the Labour left. Donald Trump has been found guilty of a hush money plot to influence the 2016 election, and we'll be discussing the latest updates from Gaza. Diane Abbott is now free to stand as a Labour MP in Hackney North, Keir Starmer has confirmed. This was the Labour leader speaking earlier today. Diane Abbott was elected in, in 1987, the first black woman MP. She's been a trailblazer. She has uh, carved a path for other people to come into politics and public life. The whip has obviously been restored to her now, um, and she is free to go forward as a Labour candidate. Have you spoken to Diane, and do you understand that she wants to put herself forward to stand? She's free to go forward as a Labour candidate. The whip is back with her, it's been restored. And of course, you know, she was a trailblazer for many, many years and has cleared the path for others to come into politics. So uh, formerly a um, matter for the NEC, but I've not expressed a view up until now. Um, she's free to go forward as a Labour candidate. Abbott was initially told by Labour that she would be blocked from standing in the upcoming election. And the seeming U-turn from Starmer follows an intense backlash condemning the cruel disposal of Britain's first ever black woman MP after 37 years of service. Shortly after the initial reports of Abbott's blocking, hundreds of people protested outside Hackney Town Hall to show their support for the veteran MP. A letter signed by dozens of prominent black British figures, including Lenny Henry, Gary Young and Afua Hirsch, described the move as an example of the systemic racism highlighted in the Ford report on factionism in the Labour Party, commissioned by Starmer himself. So the Ford report, which investigated racism in Labour, specifically highlighted the treatment of Diane Abbott as indicating a culture of unaccountable anti-blackness in the party. And perhaps the Labour leadership realised a little too late that it wasn't a great look to confirm Ford's findings so publicly. Of course, Abbott's freedom to run in her constituency doesn't let Starmer's Labour off the hook when it comes to other candidates being blocked from running. Islamophobia also did not feature very high up in the hierarchy of racism identified by Ford in the Labour Party. And Faisal Shaheen, who expected to stand in Chingford and Woodford Green, has now posted a statement giving her account of her dealings with the party machinery. I am heartbroken at this decision, but it does not come as a surprise. It is the end of a systematic campaign of bullying, racism and Islamophobia from some within the party, which began when I first announced that I wanted to run for Labour again. There are numerous examples of how I have been singled out for unfair treatment. This includes being banned from speaking publicly about my experiences of racism within the party, stripped of a paid party organiser when seven and a half months pregnant, the only candidate in a key marginal seat not to have one, and told to curb the attitude when I raised that Labour was not taking the concerns of the Muslim community seriously enough. I have not experienced this level of relentless hostility in all my personal or professional life, not even from the Conservatives. You know, it, it does go without saying that, look, representational politics doesn't mean much. We only have to look at the Conservative um, front bench to see that. You know, you can have black and brown face faces in high places pursuing deeply racist political agendas. But it does really strike me that when you look at the Labour Party front bench, even when you look at all of the images from their campaigning, um, you know, their campaign launches, the fact that the Labour Party, which is supposed to be the more progressive party in this country, can't even meet the basic threshold of a diverse front bench, of a diverse shadow front bench, of a diverse uh, group of campaigners, really shows that like they are not serious about tackling racism within their party, or at least not serious about tackling certain forms of racism 
um, within their party, and that something about the party machinery is, is clearly deeply hostile to black and brown people who are not willing to fall 100% completely and utterly in line with the current ruling faction. They are not able to, quote, get away with the kinds of things that their white counterparts are able to get away with. And it also goes without saying here that, you know, I'm not surprised that the first female prime minister of this country was a woman, was a conservative woman. I'm not surprised that the first, you know, person of color prime minister of this country was a conservative prime minister because, you know, if you are willing to be a conservative to literally preserve the existing power structure, then, you know, they can take a few, you know, variations in terms of your identity. You know, if you're as long as you have signed up to preserve the existing power hierarchy, you can be a person of color. That's fine. They'll let you get, they'll let you, you know, lead this country. But if you represent in any way a kind of counter-hegemonic politics or in any way something that says, I'm not just interested in furthering myself in the existing system, but I'm also interested in creating a politics that actually empowers other black and brown people, you know, immigrants, people of color, you know, other marginalized people in this country, then you will be punished by the establishment in this country. And it's just so, I mean, we've come, we've, we've come, we've gone so behind um, in watching the Labour Party's intolerance. And it doesn't even surprise me that the Labour Party is more authoritarian in this area. Um, and is more restrictive and rigid against the forms of political expression that their, you know, MPs of colour can express because it feels increasingly that the job of the Labour Party is literally to hamstring and limit the political imagination of marginalised people in this country, which is exactly what we're seeing by this targeting of um, not just left-wing MPs, but black and brown um, left-wing MPs in particular. Helena, the audience is gagging to know your take on this. So please let us know, you know, what do you think about this, this kind of seeming U-turn that Keir Starmer's done? Do you think it's enough to undo the damage of the past few days or is, has it gone too far in your opinion? So I don't know if you'd seen this particular, in particular, but there was a Rachel Cunliffe article in the New Statesman yesterday trying to pick apart what they think the electoral strategy has been around this for Labour. And so what it seems to me, and I think there's some degree of truth in what she said in her article, which is that for the people in the star right wing of the party, especially the ones at the top who are in charge of the strategizing, who are in charge of ensuring things go in the way of that faction, like the Starmer Politburo, if you will, I think they tried to use this kind of performative flagellation of ethnic minority, uh, black and brown voices on the left of the party as a, like a line in the sand, essentially. I mean, it's definitely was a line in the sand for me and for the people who I know who previously supported Labour and now don't, like a Rubicon was crossed. But what Rachel kind of said in her article was that, well, if they make this performative and then they can say to conservative, white conservatives who, are, who they perceive to be the swing voters they want to bring along to their electoral coalition in the kind of constituencies they need to win, they can essentially use this as the yardstick for the we have changed the Labour Party kind of vibe that they're going for. I mean, you literally see it over and over again. You hear it over and over and over again. See, it was one of the squares on our bingo card, our Starmer bingo card, about this, this changed Labour Party they do, they talk about all the time to try and distance themselves from the Corbyn era. And the people who represent the iconoclastic politics of that era, especially from marginalized communities, are the ideal people to try and market themselves, I guess, as being kind of less woke if you want to use a really kind of term that I really dislike using. And I think, I, I, I agree, I think that is probably the strategy that they were going for. But what I think is really interesting now, this backtrack specifically on Diane Abbott, it's interesting, Faisal Shaheen not being as, much of a large scale figure as Diane Abbott, not a quote unquote trailblazer as they describe Abbott to be. As much as we're sick of hearing that word particular, there's obviously a reasonable des uh, description of what Diane Abbott has done in her time in office. 
it really actually hasn't worked out in the way that they thought they did. People do like politicians to look powerful, to look as if they're in charge and look like leaders. But what they don't like is what is, in my mind, perceived to be kind of petty, cruel vindictiveness. Caroline Lucas talked about this in the interview that Aaron Bastani did with her earlier, that you posted earlier on your YouTube channel. The, it's, it seemed to be openly cruel, openly vindictive against these people. And it not only clearly marginalized huge swathes of people from black and brown backgrounds that see this as being a betrayal of what the Labour Party should stand for, like a broad church, a big ten, the, the party of diversity, for example. The, it really left a sour taste in their mouths, obviously. But on top of that, it also didn't play well with the swing voters that they thought that they were going to try and win over. Because actually, the voters in this country aren't necessarily as kind of bought into the cynicism as the people who live in the Westminster bubble and in the, the, the halls of the Labour kind of Stammer Politburo think that they are. There was a focus group earlier on today, uh, Luke Trill from More In Common quote tweeted one of their other members of his his, uh, his polling group, the focus group that they did, full of Tory to Labour switchers or Tory to don't know switchers from the 2019 election to now. And almost universally amongst people that they asked about the Diane Abbott suspension, and then obviously this now a very good quick U-turn, was that no, they didn't think that it was something that was going to make them more likely to vote Labour. They made them less likely to vote Labour. They did see it as being you know, cruel and callous, even though they didn't particularly like Diane Abbott and were happy to see that the party was different to the Labour Party they rejected in 2019. This performative cruelty wasn't something that they thought was becoming of a future prime minister. And I think they would also, as we have pointed out, would be worried about how that kind of action would play out when they're in power. Again, like the, you know, if that's what they would do to their own parliamentary colleagues, what would they do to regular members of the public when they have access to power? One last point I would make on this as well is the discussion that's always been used as a justification for what's happened to Pfizer Shaheen specifically, the smokescreen, I guess, that they use for justifying her removal from her candidacy of a, of a basically nothing. Let's be real. It's nothing. There's no reason for it to happen. It was some completely uh, inane tweets done before she was even a Labour member in most cases. And this, the one we talked about yesterday, is that the line they use is their discussion of, well, we want to, we've changed the Labour Party and we want to ensure the best quality candidates. We want to ensure that we are presenting the country with the best potential MPs or the MPs with the most talent, right? As if you can call, you know, some of the people that have been shoehorned in from the NEC into specific seats, like they're people who necessarily have talent, which is in my mind just another way of saying have connections to the lobbying industry or Price Waterhouse Coopers or whatever. Is that when you actually talk about how they define what a quality candidate is, it essentially buys into, and I think a lot of kind of centrist pundits have also gone with this line as well, is it buys into this idea that being within the Overton window, the, the Overton window vibes, is all that counts for being a good quality candidate in these people's eyes, not the connections you have to your community, like Abbott and Shaheen clearly, clearly do. We've seen the outpouring of solidarity with Abbott in her constituency specifically, and on social media about Shaheen. And, you know, Vice Shaheen, the connection to her community is incredibly strong. She's lived there the majority of her life. That's her home. That's the way, that's where she campaigns. And if that doesn't make a quality candidate, I don't know what does. But of course, you know, she's on the left wing of the party and she supports Palestine. So uh, there you go, out, gone. That's all that matters in terms of what is perceived to be a quality candidate because it fits within the Overton window. And then to top it all off, just today we've learned that they're shoehorning in a candidate from another think tank into a constituency in, I believe it's in South Wales, we're from a think tank, which the president of whom is a Tory MP. And that's not someone who's a connection to the constituency. That's not somebody who's a, a Labour activist. That's just somebody that they want to be able to shoehorn into a future cabinet position. And on top of that, the same kind of thing is happening in Brighton as well, at the same time as having a selection for replacement for Lloyd Russell Moyle too. So it really does speak to the cynicism of the current people in charge of the Labour Party, and also the disconnect in how they view how politics should be done with the broader population of this country, who don't want to see this, I mean, this, this blatant kind of factional and, you know, this what clearly kind of racist agit prop that they're trying to do to win over perceived swing voters. Yeah, I do think that that frankly quite bigoted view that, you know, red wall voters would take joy in seeing 
Diane Abbott being publicly flogged, essentially, um, pe- played a factor in this. You know, it was kind of, it, it felt like it would kill so many birds with one stone. You know, you'd get rid of, you know, someone who was obviously very associated with the Corbyn project. You would, you know, do a spectacle of racism that you think is going to court votes um, amongst a group of people that you barely even want to talk to, but you just have a very bigoted perception of who they are and what they care about. You know, it, I think they thought they saw it as this, but what they forgot was that Diane Abbott has one of the biggest margins in of any MP in terms of, you know, this the the depths to which, you know, the her her constituency really love her. And she's also a really important symbol for black people, people of color in this country. Um, and I think when you talk about, you know, the fact that actually this didn't go well with anyone, even people who, for whatever reason, including just pure racism, um, don't like Diane Abbott, um, who looked at this and thought, oh, I'm not so sure about this. I think a big part of it is also speaks to this problem of integrity. You know, we talk a lot with the Conservatives, particularly with Boris Johnson, about how this lack of integrity is ultimately what what, you know, too many, too many instances of lack of integrity, whether it's, you know, party gate, uh, you know, how he dealt with instances of, of um, ministerial conduct, etc. There was a sense that this is a man who just simply lacks integrity. And it at some point it got to a tipping point where it was too much. And to me, the only, you know, prominent politician in this country right now who actually is a competitor with Boris Johnson in terms of lack of integrity is Keir Starmer. The the way in which he deceived his way into becoming leader of the Labour Party, the way in which he's continually flip-flopping, the way in which he speaks to to the country with this very condescending tone, you know, this, this idea that he really thinks that people in this country are stupid and illiterate enough to really buy his kind of fake sincerity when he talks about Diane Abbott being a trailblazer, when clearly he has signed off or is clearly, you know, leading a party that treats someone like Diane Abbott with utter contempt, that lack of integrity, it reeks off of him. And I think it's that that is what this, this really signaled to a lot of people. This sense of you have absolutely no loyalty to your own, that how can we ever trust you when it comes to our own interests? Because we can't trust that what you say today is not going to change tomorrow. But also, we don't have any sense that you have any actual principles rather than, other than what you think is going to further your career, which is why, you know, you behaved in the way that you did. And so that lack of integrity, I think, is speaking really, really strongly. And it's honestly bizarre to me that someone so far ahead in the polls would choose to do something to bring such negative attention to him from people who have underwritten every single Labour, recent Labour victory in this country. Um, You know, people of colour who have been, who are a key constituency of the Labour Party, even though it often feels like they resent people of colour for being so important to their electoral coalition, because ultimately they have nothing but contempt for us. Former US President Donald Trump has been found guilty of 34 felony offences in a New York court. The jurors in the case unanimously agreed that Trump falsified business records in order to conceal a $130,000 hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels. This was Trump speaking to reporters after that verdict. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. We were at 5% or 6% in this district, in this area. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. The real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. And they know what happened here and everybody knows what happened here. You have a Soros-backed DA and the whole thing. We didn't do a thing wrong. I'm a very innocent man and it's okay. I'm fighting for our country. I'm fighting for our constitution. Our whole country is being rigged right now. This was done by the Biden administration in order to wound or hurt an opponent, a political opponent. And I think it's just a disgrace 
and we'll keep fighting. We'll fight till the end and we'll win. Very innocent man. Very, very innocent. The crimes that Trump has been convicted of are all Class E felonies, the lowest tier in New York State, and carrying a maximum sentence of four years. In practice, first-time offenders in New York are unlikely to face any jail time, serving probation or paying fines instead. Trump's punishment will be determined at his sentencing, currently set for the 11th of July, just days before the Republican Party confirms its nominee for November's presidential election. Many believe that Trump has strong grounds for an appeal, though, uh, a process that would delay things. And that fact alone makes it probably the next avenue for Trump's lawyers. They're likely to argue that the judge in the case, Juan Merchant, made a legal error in hearing charges brought against Trump that were themselves legally dubious. The crime of falsifying business records is a misdemeanor in New York State, though it gets elevated to a felony when the falsified records are used to conceal or commit another crime. In this case, the prosecutors argued that Trump concealed the money paid to Stormy Daniels in order to violate a state election law. But Trump's defense will likely argue that state laws don't apply to federal elections like the presidential election. Either way, Trump is now a felon and the first US president to be convicted of a crime in the country's history. The key word there being convicted. It's kind of wild that with all of the atrocities <laughs> that US presidents have committed, paying money to someone, you know, to an adult film star to make them not talk about the fact that you guys had sex seems like really honestly like the absolute least issue that we have at hand here. But that just shows that the legal system is not where we're going to get true justice. So what difference will make will that make to Trump's bid to regain the presidency? The answer is technically none. The only legal requirements to run are that the candidate is at least 35 years old and is a natural born US citizen. In theory, if Trump is, is jailed and still wins the election, he could be sworn into the White House from a prison cell on January the 6th next year. And far from hurting Trump's prospects, his guilty verdict may even enhance his chances. Journalist Mike Allen of Axion told MSNBC this. Based on my conversations this morning, uh, I can tell you the campaign expects more mega donors to come to Trump. From the Trump campaign, everything we're hearing last night, this morning, defiance. So Don Jr. is angry, but most of the people around the president are defiant. And that's what I would look for uh, when he talks this morning at Trump Tower at 11 a.m. From the Biden campaign, what we're hearing is we can't depend on this. They know that over many, many uh, years now, President Trump, former President Trump has been impervious to developments that would kill any other politician. And so, Becky, what the Biden campaign is saying, we can't depend on this to move even independent voters, even swing voters. What you're going to hear from the Biden campaign is continuing to focus on what Trump would do as president, what the stakes are for 2025, not yesterday in a Manhattan courtroom. Those Biden staffers are spot on. Nothing seems to damage Trump. And that's actually part of his appeal for many voters. And the former president now has a David versus Goliath narrative to add to his mythology, one that he and his supporters are already capitalizing on. This was far-right Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's reaction before the verdict was even announced. I've been saying this from the beginning. We will vote for President Donald J. Trump, even if he's in jail. A wrongful conviction will bring a landslide for Trump and prove to America that Democrats are the party of corruption, communism, and tyrants. Go ahead, pull the curtain back. At a speech at Trump Towers this afternoon, Trump addressed the impact of this conviction on his campaign. The other thing, a poll just came out. The first poll, I don't know, maybe others will be bad. But a poll just came out a little while ago. The Daily Mail. Does anybody read the Daily Mail? It's very good. They have a good poll. At least I like it today. And the Daily Mail just came out with a poll. And it has Trump up six points in the last... 12 hours, six points. Six points since this happened. Who thought this could happen? 
Because the people of our country know it's a hoax. They know it's a hoax. They get it. You know, they're really smart. At least I like the I like the Daily Mail today because they did something that I like. I mean, I guess that that there's there's a level of just honesty there, at least I guess. But when we're talking about you know what impact is this going to have on the election? Look, the diehard MAGA fans, they're like no external data or information is going to change their narrative of who Donald Trump is. So in a sense, like they're not the P. I mean, there are some reasons why we should be concerned about them being emboldened by this. But in terms of actually the election outcome, I guess what I would say is probably going to shape what impact this is going to have is how are undecided people going to perceive this? You know, are they, does the idea of a guilty verdict resonate with them? Like, and that kind of speaks to, to what extent they have faith in the judiciary system. You know, I don't expect the MAGA people to, you know, they obviously have no faith in anything that does something that they don't like, that kind of goes against their hero, Donald Trump. But, you know, with the independence, it's a little bit difficult to say because generally, you know, there is a sense that amongst the, that kind of group that, you know, the judiciary saying something is kind of a, a, a open and shut case. It's kind of like a line under the in the sand. Um, but at the same time, I mean, if anyone knows how to spin a narrative in, their, in, in his favor, um, it's Donald Trump. And we're also, I think there's a particular genius there, unfortunately, whether accidental or not, to him talking about this being part of a broader rigged system, because it's that very sense of like, the system is rigged against me that resonates so much with so many people, because in many cases, the system is genuinely rigged against them. Of course, in Donald Trump's case, it's not. Um, he committed this, he committed this crime and he got convicted. He's one of the few members of the elite of the establishment to actually get held accountable for something they've done. What I think might be quite convincing um, as an argument, which I think is probably something that the Trump campaign, you know, or at least Trumpers might try and advocate if I was, you know, if they had any kind of savviness, rather than advocating for Trump being innocent, advocating for this line of Trump is being targeted because if you look in the books of any millionaire, of any billionaire, of any, you know, high power person in New York, politician, financial elite, whatever, you will find something in their books that's off. But they just went after me for political reasons. Now, the, the problem with that is that that's kind of difficult to contest. I mean, we're talking about what accountancy stuff we're talking about forms of fraud i mean no one becomes a millionaire or a billionaire without doing something shady so that line of argument is going to be a little more difficult for the democrats to really wrench themselves out of but there was one thing that all the attention garnered by trump's trial guaranteed him and that is an audience of millions as he made his statement and the former president took advantage of it in typical populist fashion. But now record levels of terrorists, record levels, the highest level we've ever seen of terrorists are pouring into our country. You have China with just in the last few months, 29,000 people came in and I looked at them on a line and they look like perfect soldiers. They're almost all male from 19 to 25. It looks like a recruiting exercise. They have beautiful tents. They have propane stoves. They have cell phones, the best you can buy. I said, what's going on? It looks like they're building an army right in our country. Now, I don't think that would happen, right? We're losing our country. And I really think that this is an event, what took place yesterday with this judge. Look, we have conflicted, but he's a crooked judge. And you'll understand that. And I say that knowing that it's very dangerous for me to say that, and I don't mind, because I'm willing to do whatever I have to do to save our country and to save our Constitution. Scares me for many reasons. I'm joined now by Ben Burgess, columnist at Jacobin and philosophy professor at Rutgers University. Ben, in your estimation, what impact is this going to have on Trump's chances of winning the election? Yeah, I think we have no idea yet. Uh, you know, this is, you know, we're entering uncharted waters. 
And I know there are polls in the past where people say that a felony conviction would be a big problem and they wouldn't vote for uh, for you know a candidate who had one. But I also think that voters are really bad at predicting um, how they're going to feel about something that hasn't happened yet. And, um, and a lot of it has to do with how it's, you know, how it's spun, uh, going forward. I mean, I think, you know, I think what, you know, Democrats should say is that, uh, this is really, really good that the rule of law is being applied to a U.S. president that, you know, kings and emperors are supposed to be above the law, but public officials and democratic republics, uh, aren't supposed to be. But I think as you kind of indicated, uh, just a minute ago, the problem with that argument is that there are so many U.S. presidents who have obviously committed much greater crimes and haven't been held accountable. And uh, so if we were really serious about the rule of law, how is it that Donald Trump is, you know, has a felony conviction for the first time for a former president in U.S. history for hush money payments to a porn star and falsifying the business, uh, you know, business records because of that. Whereas like George W. Bush, for example, walks free. Yeah. And I think there's this ongoing frustration that I'm having with the Democrats and, you know, liberals more generally, which is they think they can short circuit their way, shortcut their way into defeating Trump without actually doing the political work. I mean, do you, why are, I mean, my all I can go off is Twitter, but it seems like Democrats and kind of liberals in the US are just uncritically celebrating this verdict. Why are they not more nervous about the potential that this has to galvanize his base? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that what we've really seen is year after year after year of uh, liberals hoping that something besides politics would save them from Trump. Um, so whether it was, you know, 2016 that, you know, the Access Hollywood tape was going to be what brought him down or, um, you know, the during much of the first term, there were all these liberal hopes that were pinned on the Mueller investigation into, you know, alleged Russian collusion, that that's what was going to do it um, to even the you know, even the attempts to strike him off some, uh, some state ballots more recently. And of course, you know, none, none of that has been, has been effective, you know, I mean, which is what, like I was, you know, in some ways it was kind of hardening to, you know, see in that clip that you played earlier, uh, this report that even Biden staffers, uh, are starting to, to get the memo that the idea that, you know, there's going to be some event that when that event happens, okay, now he's done, uh, isn't really in touch with observable reality. I mean, if you start the clock with, um, you know, Trump going down the escalator in 2015 to give his presidential announcement speech, I mean, we're on the 10th season of this show and, uh, none of it has worked, but I, I think that, I think that there's a persistent temptation, uh, by liberals to, to think that it, it will because they don't want to believe that they have to actually win through politics, through, you know, appealing to voters better, especially right now when uh, I think that, you know, the state of the economy is still pretty bad. Liberal pundits, you know, keep telling people that if they just focus on the right few quantitative measures and only pay attention to the trend line and not the absolute numbers, uh, then, uh, then people shouldn't, you know, should actually see that, you know, things aren't that bad. But I think that's not the, you know, collective experience that a lot of Americans are having right now. And if, and in particular, right now, um, a lot of people who voted for Biden in 2020 are absolutely furious at him over uh, the atrocities in Gaza. And he really doesn't want to think that he has to listen to them about that. Uh, so if they can tell themselves that something like this is going to bring down Trump for them, uh, so you don't need to shore up this, you know, disenchanted part of your base, then yeah, that's great. That's a permission slip to keep doing what they're doing. So I, I have no trouble whatsoever understanding why they want that to be true. I just don't think it is true. Mm, they want to do anything but politics, right? Um, I saw a poll recently that said that 
one in five Americans believe political violence is necessary to, quote, take their country back, which is a specifically right wing talking point. Between that and Trump sort of stirring up these images of invasions and bloodbaths if he isn't reelected, should we be worried that this is happening in a country that's full of guns? Yeah, I would say on the bloodbath point in particular, I wrote about this for Jacobin when it happened. And like the way that that comment was reported and then the way it was spun by people in the Trump camp was really frustrating. I think really symptomatic of a lot of what's happened in the Trump era uh, because right wingers pointed out, not without justice, that um, – when he used the word bloodbath in a speech, he seemed to be talking about like a, you know, like he seemed to be using it as a metaphor when talking about the auto industry, you know, it's, it's going to be a bloodbath. Uh, he did mutter something to himself about like more generally, but he'd been talking about the auto industry just before and just after. And so all of these right wing outlets said, see, see, this is, you know, the liberal media pulling off this, you know, they called the bloodbath hoax. And they're not completely wrong. I think, I think that was pretty sloppy reporting, but also in the same speech, in fact, in the same, you know, pretty close to when he said that, uh, he, uh, he said about, you know, he did all this fear mongering about immigrants who are supposedly, you know, MS-13 members who, uh, he said without evidence had been like driven, taken straight out of prison and driven to the border, which is obviously nonsense. And he said, um, he said they're not even human. So, I mean, there, there is like really disturbing, xenophobic, uh, dehumanizing language that was really used. But, you know, I think that attention got sort of shifted away from that to, um, you know, to the bloodbath. Uh, I, I mean, I don't I guess I guess I am skeptical that there is actually in practice uh, as you know, I mean, I'm not surprised that there are people who will tell pollsters, you know, like anything that sounds extreme or, you know, based to them, uh, that's, that's pro Trump that they'll, they'll say it. I am a little skeptical. That there is a large portion of people who are really willing to, um, you know, to take up arms in, uh, in that way. Uh, I think that, uh, when you look at the, you know, aftermath of, of, you know, January 6th, when, even without any of the rioters having, you know, actually shot anyone, the legal system still came down quite hard on them. Trump abandoned them to their fate uh, instead of pardoning any of them. Uh, and then there were all these predictions that there was going to be more violence at state houses. There's going to be more violence at the inauguration, and that didn't happen. And so I, I think a lot of people actually would have quite a bit to lose. So I'm, I, I think I'm less worried about sort of violence from Trump supporters than about the sort of just boring but dismal scenario that Trump, that, you know, Biden is going to stumble his way into defeat in a completely winnable election uh, because he uh, he doesn't want to reverse course on Gaza and he doesn't want to do the things that he would have to do to uh, shore up his base. And then we're going to get uh, we're going to get a another Trump term. And, of you know, that's going to be what the last Trump term was, which is to say an orgy of deregulation and union busting and tax cuts for rich people. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I think that's plenty bad just all on its own. Yeah. So you think it's uh, people sort of saying like, yeah, I'll take uh, someone else could take up arms. Not me, though. I'm 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 too too precious for that. Um Anyway, that is reassuring to hear. Ben Burgess, thank you so much for joining us. Um, right. in, in, <laughs> in the UK, um, Donald Trump has his supporters too. This was Oliver from Harrow calling into Ben Kentish's LBC show. Fire away. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's very entertaining. Listen. He's going to get away with it and he's going to win. Watch November. Yeah. This is just a play. He's not going to be, he's not going to go to prison. I, I know that's what you want, but it's not going to happen. Trump's going to win. You see all my black people, my Hispanic, what he did in, in the Bronx. That was amazing. That was a success. And I know that it's very cringy for you. He's going to win. Trump is a Terminator. He's a cyborg. You can't stop him. You can do whatever you want. But Joe Biden stopped him last time around, didn't he? <laughs> He's a t 
Ten men won't kick me. But he did, Oliver. I mean, he lost to Joe Biden. <laughs> no. So you, this, you can't this stop him. This is a new Trump. This is a new one. Watch. A new what? Just watch. What am, I, what am I watching? You're going to cry. Listen, you can't stop this man. What do you like about him? He's invincible. He's invincible, he's invincible so much that he lost the last he's election he ran. Invincible. He's so he's invincible he lost to Joe years. Biden. He's still there. Joe Biden he's not, is he? to a home, nursing home. <laughs> Oliver, I'll leave it there. Thank you for your call. Oh. <laughs> Helena, what do you think is going on here? I mean, what what was that about? I mean, I think it really speaks to what you were discussing in like the previous trail up to this, especially with Ben as well, about this idea of Trump being this anti-establishment candidate. Because when you look at the kind of things was asked plenty of times by Ben Kentish there, what did it, what's it, what did, how does, why does Trump appeal to you? Why do you think this way? Very little detail was put forward, but guffawing at this idea of the anti-establishment man being invincible, right? No kind of a nebulous support base, support base, really. And that kind of underpins most of Trump's appeal to people. He isn't part of the political class. And that's broadly the kind of base that led him to victory, especially in 2016, notably amongst kind of maybe Sanders to Trump switchers, for example, which was definitely a, a, a factor in his victory in 2016, just people who were sick of establishment politicians. Obviously, of course, the trial result is, yeah, these were all bad things that he's done. But when you look at, for example, you compare them to the remainder of the political class, like when when has anybody been held accountable for any of the things that they've done out of all of the kind of the, the, the dynastic political classes of America, like the Clintons and the Bushes, for example, especially those two in specific, or even Trump's own like political failures in office and say, for example, like giving up the Kurds to Erdogan or whatever, like when have these things properly been punished in real terms? They never have been. They never have been, right? So this appearance of a political stitch-up is, as you say, galvanizing for a base of people who just want there to be an anti-establishment politician for them to be able to follow and support. And you'll notice as well, that exemplifies this, is it wasn't necessarily a lot of joy at this idea of a vindication of what kind of Trump's done or what Trump, what his kind of political kind of policy or kind of is, is what he stands for. But this kind of guffawing idea of, Joe Biden losing, uh, the humiliation of the political class. Like you, you try to get rid of him through all of this, but you're going to cry when he gets elected and your boy Joe Biden loses eventually after previously having you know, defeated Trump. But this is a new Trump now. It was all very kind of, it wasn't really very coherent, but that's what happens when you have people who only stand in politics by being a foil to somebody else. And these are the kind of people who you'll bring into your base and they can't even articulate particularly why they support you. I mean, literally we heard the statements, well, why do you support? He's invincible. He's a cyborg. What, what does this even mean? What it does, it does signify is a core base of people. Again, again, unless you actually approach politics through a material analysis by understanding uh, the reasons why things have failed in terms of the political class because of not who they are or who they support, but what kind of material interests that they have. You can end up lionizing somebody like Donald Trump, again, who has similar material interests to all of these people, but just doesn't come from like a political dynasty. And then you end up with this kind of, it's almost like a kind of conspiracy theory mindset of the deep state trying to get somebody. And then the idea that that would then come to bite them in the ass come the election time, that it would create this reaction where you just are, you really want to see your opponents mad rather than wanting to be able to build upon some kind of political project that Trump supports, which is what I kind of get from a lot of the reactions that I see, where it's more about triggering the libs, quote unquote, than it is necessarily about whether or not Trump support, like, actually has anything politically that you agree with. Mm, which should make him an easy opponent. And yet here we are. The IDF has partially withdrawn from the Jabalaya refugee camp in northern Gaza after a 20-day operation, and what they've left behind can only be described as utter devastation. The latest onslaught on the camp saw Israeli forces use both aircraft and ground forces with devastating consequences. Entire residential blocks, food markets and warehouses have been bombed out of existence. According to reports, corpses remain scattered in the streets. But Jabalaya resident Asma al-Masri told Al Jazeera this. There is no longer Jabalaya camp. There are no schools and hospitals. The scale of destruction is so great that no one imagines. And the destruction cannot be counted. 
We, the people of Gaza, have a strong determination. Gaza will return better than before. Before Israel's assault on Gaza began, over 100,000 Palestinians lived in Jabalaya, which covers an area of roughly half a square mile. And following the IDF's advance on the area earlier this month, many residents fled to UNRWA schools and other facilities for shelter. Today, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees reported this. The last weeks, we've received horrific reports from UNRWA facilities in Jabalaya, North Gaza. Displaced people, including children, reportedly killed and injured, sheltering in our schools, besieged by IDF tanks. Tents of people sheltering at our school reportedly set on fire by the IDF. As the IDF began their departure from the area, Palestinians tried to return to their homes. But even then, nowhere was safe. The Israeli military has justified their destruction of the area by saying that Hamas had turned it into, quote, a fortified combat complex. Perhaps that's just another name for city when you're conducting an urban offensive there. The IDF also says that during its three-week raid on the refugee camp, it destroyed a tunnel network that had been used to hold hostages. The IDF also recovered the bodies of seven people who they say were killed on October 7th. According to the Israeli military, they killed hundreds of Hamas fighters in what IDF soldiers have called the most intense fighting of the war. But experts take a slightly different view, with the Institute for the Study of War saying this. The IDF assessed two weeks into the Jabalia operation that three Hamas battalions are active there rather than just one. Palestinian militias conducted an unusually high rate of attacks targeting Israeli forces in Jabalaya during this period. Hamas and other Palestinian militias will almost certainly resume their efforts to reconstitute in Jabalaya as Israeli forces withdraw. There are remaining pockets around Jabalaya that Israeli forces have not cleared. So the idea there basically being that there's no military significance to this other than destruction of refugee infrastructure. The IDF has also been intensifying its operation in Rafa. That was an airstrike on a building in Rafa, clearly surrounded by tents. While nearly a million displaced Palestinians have left since the IDF moved into the area, moving north to the coast for safety, many civilians still remain. The IDF has said it is now operating in the centre of the city, despite pressure from international allies to scale back its offensive. That's also in violation of the International Court of Justice, which ruled last week that Israel should halt its offensive in Rafah. Israel has also taken control of the Philadelphia Corridor along Gaza's border border with Egypt. That's a nine-mile strip of land serving as a buffer zone between Egypt and Gaza, a piece of no-man's land ceded to Egyptian control when Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005. It's a development that's angered Egypt, one of Israel's closest allies in the region, The country has said it is, quote, ready to respond to Israel's seizure of the corridor. Israel has accused Hamas of smuggling weapons across the border into Gaza via the the corridor, a claim that Egypt denies. These new pressures add to an already fraught situation after tensions rose earlier this week after Israeli soldiers shot an Egyptian border guard dead. And in signs of the conflict spreading further across the region, the US and the UK have bombed Yemen for the fifth time since Israel began its war on Gaza. According to officials, the joint operation targeted underground facilities and missile launches. But according to the Houthi Ministry of Health, 16 civilians were killed and 40 more more were injured. If that's right, it will be the biggest loss of life in Yemen since the US and UK began degrading the Houthi military in response to attacks on ships passing through the Red Sea. Yemenis protested that attack today at the country's weekly pro-Palestine demonstration in Sana'a. The Houthis say they are attacking Western-linked shipping companies in solidarity with Palestine. And it certainly proved to be an effective form of economic sanction. In November, over a 1,000 shipping vessels passed through the Suez Canal. 
By March, that number was just 85, with insurers forcing ships to travel the much longer and much more costly route between Europe and Asia via the Cape of Good Hope. Over 180 academics and administrators from Gaza's universities have signed a letter calling on the world to help resist the ongoing attack on their higher education system. Throughout its war on Gaza, Israel has relentlessly attacked civilian infrastructure, and this includes destroying or damaging all 12 universities in the Strip. The letter depicts the current situation on the ground like this. We issue this call from beneath the bombs of the occupation forces across occupied Gaza, in the refugee camps of Rafah, and from the sites of temporary new exile in Egypt and other host countries. We are disseminating it as the Israeli occupation continues to wage its genocidal campaign against our people daily, in its attempt to eliminate every aspect of our collective and individual life. Over the past seven months, Israel have killed more than 5,500 students, 250 teachers, and 95 university professors, with several thousand being severely injured and traumatized. 60% of educational facilities, including 13 public libraries, have been destroyed or damaged, and education has been suspended for 625,000 school children and 88,000 university students, none of whom will be able to graduate this year. This is part of a pattern of attacking the Palestinian education system. A group of UN experts, including the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, Farida Shahid, have previously said this. With more than 80% of schools in Gaza damaged or destroyed, it may be reasonable to ask if there is an intentional effort to comprehensively destroy the Palestinian education system, an action known as scholasticide. So that term, scholasticide, was coined by Palestinian scholar Carmen Abulsi following the 2009 war on Gaza. The term refers to the systemic destruction in whole or in part of the educational life of a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. So this can be through the harassment, detention and killing of educators, students and educational administrators as well as through the destruction of teaching and research resources like libraries, archives, and laboratories. The point here is that scholasticide destroys the educational life of a group or community. And that's really important because when we think about what genocide is, it's not just about the physical elimination of a people. It's also about the attempt to eliminate the existence of a people as a people as an identity and a community. In fact, the Genocide Convention specifically highlights the mental as well as physical elements of genocide. Destroying the ability of people to exist as a national, ethnic, racial or religious group involves destroying the civil infrastructures through which that group creates and memorializes its history, knowledge and identity. And by destroying universities and schools and the people who work in them, You're not only trying to destroy a community's future, but also the records of their past. And this chimes with many other attacks, including, for example, the destruction of the Gaza City archives, which contains thousands of historical documents dating back more than 150 years. And the letter really powerfully highlights this broader impact. Our civic infrastructure, our universities, schools, hospitals, libraries, museums, and cultural centers, built by generations of our people, lies in ruins from this deliberate, continuous Nakba. The deliberate targeting of our educational infrastructure is a blatant attempt to render Gaza uninhabitable and erode the intellectual and cultural fabric of our society. However, we refuse to allow such acts to extinguish the flame of knowledge and resilience that burns within us. And that flame uh, of knowledge and resilience is indeed still alive and well, as shown by this image, which shows a graduate student of Al-Azhar University in Gaza defending his master's thesis from a displacement tent. Earlier today, I spoke to Dr. Ahmed Abu Shaban, the Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture and Veterinary Medicine at Al-Azhar University in Gaza, and one of the signatories of the letter, 
And I began by asking him about the role of universities like Al-Azhar and what they play in the life of him and his students. The Al-Azhar universities and other universities in Gaza just standing as a great opportunity for them to uh, obtain their high education. Uh, and, you know, Al-Azhar University started... Uh, a small university with the limited resources, uh, under incubation, with all the restrictions uh, made by the Israeli incubation on the high education system, but with uh, a lot of efforts and support from, um, um, I mean, international community, we were able to actually to uh, build actually a, a huge university with. Um, currently more than 14,000 students, 12 faculties, 80 uh, bachelor program, 30 master program, and five PhD programs with uh, several uh, um, research institutes uh, and community services, actually centers providing services uh, and uh, research uh, to support actually uh, the Palestinian uh, 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 economy uh, and different uh, sectors within uh, Gaza Strip. I mean, uh, Al-Azhar University is uh, one of those uh, institutions that reflects actually the resilience of the Palestinian people over their land in Gaza. And given that role that you've outlined, particularly in light of the fact that Palestinians in Gaza, their ability to engage in higher education has been both globally and even within Palestine has been so difficult. How has the war impacted the higher education system in Gaza and you know, your colleagues and your students in particular? It is more intense, this war, but I mean, this is not the first time Israelis actually, they have their policy actually to target the higher education system in uh, Palestine in general, but in Gaza in most particular. Uh, we have uh, before in previous uh, uh, wars against, uh, uh, I mean, on Gaza, destroying several buildings, laboratories, uh, research stations of the university. Uh, but this time, actually, it was really massive that they destroyed almost all the buildings, destroyed all the um, facilities, including laboratories, research stations, uh, even uh, training centers. Uh, so they left literally nothing. I mean, the only only the new campus that actually was recently actually completed and uh, was operating like a couple of years ago, it was totally destroyed. They occupied the buildings, and after occupying the buildings, they just destroyed everything, simply reflecting, I mean, that it is not kind of a, a hot conflict zone, and they wish actually to... Uh, or that that was that became accidentally no it was intentionally meant to destroy all the universities leaving not only the fourteen thousand students uh, in my university without um, the, uh, the the higher education but also uh, all one hundred thousand uh, uh, university students in Gaza are actually left without their uh, uh, universities and, uh, uh, of course, all the academic staff also lost their jobs. And uh, the most actually serious thing that it is threatening the existence and the presence of Palestinian people over their land, because uh, the rule of the universities is not only high education, it is actually a symbolic of uh, our presence and sustainability and resilience uh, of the Palestinian uh, people. Uh, uh, and this is actually one of their uh, intention, actually. They wish actually to make Gaza unlivable. There are many reasons as well why 
oppressed people, marginalized people around the world identify with the Palestinians. But a big reason is because Palestinian writers, scholars, historians, archivists, who many of whom have been trained in these universities, have been such great educators around the world of their own struggle and also what the Palestinian struggle means for for all of our freedoms. And so that kind of international resonance as well is something that the Israelis are trying to to extinguish by by this this assault. Um, But, you know, talking about that kind of global outlook, the letter that you signed on to is addressed to the world. So what are your um, what is your demand to those around the world, particularly those uh, in higher education? You see the solidarity all over the world. I mean, the the wonderful, beautiful, effective students uprising, trying to support and show solidarity with the Palestinian people in um, all universities or many universities all over the world, uh, and uh, solidarity shown by... uh, academics and some even academic institution over all over the world, they have one question, how can we support? Uh, and there, there is actually good intention to help and support Palestinian uh, high education system. Uh, unfortunately, with those good intentions, uh, sometimes we may just end up supporting part of the systems to find opportunities outside the system, like providing a scholarship for students to join other universities outside Gaza or outside Palestine, uh, providing some fellowships, visiting professor uh, positions for the academics, uh, trying to support people to get out of the because, of course, this is a need. I mean, for a student who lost his university, he needs a university to stay. Or an academic who lost his job, he needs a job. He needs uh, a university to place him and, to, of course, to provide him with a, with a job to sustain his livelihood. This is good at individual level. But unfortunately, I mean, at national interest level, this is not good because... If we just look at this, we are trying now to, with good intention to support people, but we are also evacuating the system from uh, of its its components. So let's just imagine if the students left the university and the academics left the university, and in one or two years after actually the end of the war, we just rehabilitate the buildings and we want to resume work of the universities inside Gaza. While we do, we lost most of our academics and most of our students, they are searching actually opportunities outside. So I think this would not be really helpful. I mean, if we just think about the resilience. And as a Palestinian, I mean, as I, I just described before, I mean, this is maybe the most intense uh, Uh, And the most, uh, I mean, destructive uh, war that actually caused total damage of all facilities. But we faced this before. We had also some buildings where, 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 where destroyed before. We rebuilt those buildings. We just restarted again. I mean, this is the resilience of the Palestinian people to stay on uh, to stay in their land, resume their work, and stay there. Now, what should we do? I believe we should support Palestinian universities inside Gaza to resume provision of their education, teaching, research activities, given the ongoing situation. Maybe at such early stage, while actually the the conflict is still ongoing, it's very difficult to think about um, uh, uh, rehabilitating the buildings, but we can support the resilience of the people. We can, I mean, Al-Azhar University is currently, uh, I mean, starting from next week, we are starting online teaching. 
uh, many of the colleagues who just uh, are displaced now in Egypt and many others who are just in the tents in, in Gaza, they will just provide lectures online. And very important issue also, we should never, never decide for uh, uh, academic institutions inside Gaza without actually asking the people inside Gaza what they want. Uh, uh, you know, there are many initiatives were done to support Gaza, which is really wonderful and um, uh, helpful. But we need to consider that the future of the academic system in Gaza should be uh, uh, actually decided by academics and the students in Gaza. And they should, I mean, give it the opportunity to uh, uh, deliver their voice to the uh, international community and uh, just informing uh, uh, everybody about uh, the intention to uh, keep resisting the Israeli uh, uh, policy uh, to destroy our higher education uh, uh, system and to seek support of the higher education institutions in Gaza. We've had a look at uh, this really powerful image uh, of a master's student at Al-Azhar University, where you graduated from and, and work. Uh, and he's defending his thesis literally amongst the rubble. As someone from Al-Azhar University, what does that image represent to you? Yeah, it's simply resilience that uh, you can uh, demolish the buildings, you can destroy the batteries, you can even kill uh, colleagues and some of the students, uh, but our, uh, our uh, resilience, you, they cannot kill. We, we, we will resist and we will stay in. This is our land. That was Dr. Ahmed Abu Shaban of Al Azhar University in Gaza, who spoke to me earlier today. We also have an update on Gaza. Uh, according to US President Joe Biden, Israel has made a ceasefire and hostage proposal to Hamas. The full details haven't been released, but we understand it will come in three phases. First, a six week ceasefire. Second, the return of remaining hostages. And third, a reconstruction plan for Gaza. Biden has also urged both Israel and Hamas to accept it. I'm sure we'll have more on those developments next week. It's worth thinking about what rebuilding kind of means in this context, because, you know, we know, we know what disaster capitalism does. It causes destruction and then it, it reshapes the, the, what it cre you know, the destruction it creates into a very particular image. And one thing that was really stressed in that interview that um, I had with Dr. Ahmed is that rebuilding and reconstruction has to be bottom up. It has to be Palestinians being able and given the space and the freedom to rebuild their own society, which has been destroyed. And that includes, you know, higher education, it includes civilian infrastructure, libraries, cultural centers, all of these things that make a community a community. Um, so, but yeah, just that, that little update, um, there that came in during the show on Wednesday, LBC host Ian Dale quit his job and ran away to join the circus, otherwise known as standing to be a Tory MP. His chosen seat was Tunbridge Wells where he lives, right? That makes sense. But less than 48 hours later, the dream had turned to ashes. This is Dale explaining to LBC's Nick Ferrari why he has dropped out. Well, on Wednesday morning, so literally less than 12 hours after I'd done that little speech on Tuesday evening, um, I got a text sent from the local Conservative Party saying that they had had a communication from the Liberal Democrats um, with this clip from the For the Many podcast from two years ago, in which I had said, and of course I hadn't remembered this at all, in which I had said that I didn't like living in Tunbridge Wells and I'd quite happily live somewhere else. Now, I instantly recognised the problems with that. Um, there, there is a context to it, but nobody's interested in con context or nuance in these situations. You just have that little clip, and that would be on every single Lib Dem leaflet that was put out in the election campaign. 
I mean, it's funny because these media outlets always try to say, you know, we're neutral, our, you know, we're doing journalism, no one, you know, will you'll never know what our kind of political inclinations are. And then one of them just goes off to run to be a conservative MP. I'm like, okay, that doesn't seem super neutral. To, at least here we put it all out on the open. You know, we're leftists, we're progressive, whatever. Um, it's just funny when that veil of neutrality, even just for a minute, like gets, I mean, it's not really a, it's not really a very well held veil, but you know what I mean. Um, Helena, what do you think? I'm not a big fan of Ian Dale, but I think what it does speak to a lot to is this problem that we have with political careerism in general, where we don't seem to properly understand what being a politician is supposed to be. And Ian Dale isn't the only one who has been guilty of doing these things. It's not just Ian Dale. We all see the people, we've seen the Paul Masons of this world trying to you know, use their position as somebody who's a journalist or whatever to probably get a seat, multiple different seats. Uh, we've seen Susie as a do the very same thing and I don't think necessarily places that that she has any kind of connection to. And of course, there is the infamous Sebastian Payne continually trying to get access to some kind of safe seat to be able to turn what is a career completely outside of like party politics or politics within a certain uh, kind of campaigning system and then use that to be able to fulfill some kind of dream of being a kind of political actor at this point. Because I mean, at the end of the day, if you're the kind of person who's going to say things like, well, I don't really enjoy living in this place, I'm just living next to my partner wanted to or whatever, like, does that, that doesn't really show you any kind of connection to the constituency. And when you look at the other names I mentioned, they have zero connection to the constituency. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier on in the show as well, that there is this kind of problem with kind of parachuting happening. And again, obviously we see that with Paul War and all the people who are kind of party apparatchiks being parachuted into seats and kind of breaking one of the kind of fundamental parts. So we get sold to us is this kind of lie of the constituency link under first past the post. This continually gets touted as to us. There's a reason to keep this link between the constituents and their MP, their specific representatives for the area that they are in rather than just being part of like a party structure that they then represent within Westminster, rather than somebody who might theoretically dissent because that's what their constituents want, which very rarely happens because of how powerful the whip system is. And really and truly, we need to just get, a, get rid, just completely get rid of celebrities and journalists and people who aren't actually part of like the actual groundwork of what it takes to be a political campaigner and a political activist to have a complete kind of moratorium on these people to having access to politics because it makes a whole mockery of what politics really should be which is a connection between legislators who serve the people right when we pay their bills literally it shouldn't should ever be just a place where celebrities go to be able to get their jollies for their political cause celebrities really and truly. And that's what really I find quite funny about all of this is that I really don't think that Ian Dale has much on his mind other than just wanting to be somebody who has now has a career in politics rather than this kind of genuine desire to serve the country as a political representative. Yeah, it's just a CV line for these people, isn't it? Uh, that's all for us tonight. We've kept you here way longer than normal, but there was a lot of important stuff to squeeze into today's show. Thank you so much, Helena, for joining me. You were incredible as always. And thanks everyone um, for watching us this evening. Make sure to come back on Monday. Uh, for now, you've been watching Navara Media. Good night.